Vigna. We are Vineyard. I want to be very clear. This is all John Wimber. Of course. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. My, my job is to facilitate and really, I would ask questions. You know, I'd say like, yeah. well, this might not be clear to the reader. We're always, always wanting to come to terms with the reader. We also were very concerned that the writing, it wasn't just for the vineyard. You've got to remember in 84, I mean, there was no real vineyard denomination or, right. you know, it was meeting a broad section of people from Roman Catholics, Pentecostals, Baptists, Presbyterian, mainline. And so Power Evangelism is still in publication. A few years ago, Christianity Today uh, named uh, Power Evangelism the 12th most significant book written in evangelicalism in the last 50 years. Then we jumped into, of course, Power Healing. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, for me personally, Power Healing, that's my favorite book. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. In today's episode, our host, Jay Pathak, National Director for Vineyard USA, talks to Kevin Springer. Kevin wrote this month's recommended resource, Power Healing with John Wimber. Let's listen in. Kevin, I appreciate you joining us to do our podcast and... If you've not listened to it, mostly it's just story. I love to hear people's stories okay. and how that led into the vineyard. And you're you are an OG in the vineyard. You 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 are you are of the original. And so it, it, I'm excited to hear a bit about how you came into life with Christ, what your story led up to the vineyard, and it it just means a lot. You'd make time to talk to me. So thanks. Well, Jay, uh, thanks for having me on, and um, I feel very honored to be able to uh, be a part of this. Yeah, my story begins when I was working as an editor at Servant Publications. Oh, oh wait a minute. No, I, I want to go way before that. I want to know where you were born. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I want your actual whole, like, I'd love to hear where you were born and how you grew up. Start there. Well... Uh, I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but but actually my parents are Hoosiers. Oh, wow. And, and my name is Noble, which is Noble Sinclair name, Sinclair name, the city of Cincinnati, Cincinnati. Uh, my my line of nobles, Noble, there's a Noblesville in Indiana, Noble County yeah. in um, eastern Indiana and in western Ohio, a noble. Those are for my nobles. The, my, my noble. So really, uh, okay. Yeah, like my dad said, I was born, burped, and handed to basketball because that's what they do in, in Indiana. Dude, I'm telling you, that is for real. I've been around there for the state tournament, you know, because yeah. of course I grew up in Ohio. Yeah, and I was visiting friends, and it was like, wow, this is a world. I mean, it's it, it is, is life. So my my father was transferred to Milwaukee just before I was born, and I was. Okay born there. And then when I was about two, my family moved over to Birmingham, Michigan, which yeah. is a suburb just north of Detroit. Yep. I know exactly and, where it is. And uh, we lived on Dorchester Road for about three or four years. And uh, right across the street in the house uh, was the first friend outside my family I met. Her name was Suzanne Nadal. And she was the, the woman who would become my wife one day. Wow. Wait, so oh. you lived across the street and we were we were inseparable for wow years. since and you were I, like four or five no since two three four five six and uh yeah we got into trouble together you know so <laughs> and i i was uh baptized and uh raised in the episcopal church mm. and um cranbrook there in near birmingham and my father then took a transfer. He wanted to, he was uh, with a big corporation and he, he uh, wanted to uh, come to Southern California because he saw that as the land of promise, whatever. And I had uh, three siblings. And so he, he, came, he went out to California carefully, um, looked all around Southern California. And, and we ended up, I ended up being raised in Pacific Palisades, which is, kind of a small town in, in the um, 
shadow of Los Angeles. Yep. And, um, and so I went to uh, Palisades Elementary through Palisades High School, and then I, then I went to USC. And but it was wait, so, but then that means that your your now wife you left in Michigan. She, her father, who was um, Suzanne's father, was a was an executive with Ford Motor Corporation. Oh, okay. And he he at one point was a general sales manager for the Ford Motor Corporation. Wow. And eventually he he became the Western Regional Manager. It's kind of complicated. So Suzanne relocated in a place called Rolling Hills, which is on the Palisades Peninsula. Uh huh. Suzanne and I, our senior year, Suzanne, uh, we had a class. Uh, now I didn't know she was Suzanne Nadal. In fact, I was sitting in the classroom, kind of looking out over Bobard Field at USC, watching O.J. Simpson run wind sprints. Wow. <laughs> Because I was in the same class as OJ. And by the way, it wasn't for another 20 years that OJ didn't kill his wife. (laughs) Right. right. So um, when Suzanne walked in, I didn't really into the classroom. It was a weird class because Suzanne was a French major. And and I was in biology. And uh, but we had to take this class outside our major our senior year. And Suzanne really should have been at Stanford, and I should have been at UCLA. It's mm. complicated, but we ended up there. And um, when the teacher, there were just maybe 20 students in the class, and the teacher said, hey, why don't we get to know each other? We're seniors. This is no big deal here. We're finishing up. And it was, I think, 19th century European history we were studying. Mm. So uh, I said, I'm, you know, Kevin Springer. I went to Palisades High School. And, and said my major and I noticed this gal kind of sitting in the row behind me was really perking up and she said well I'm Suzanne Nadal <laughs> you know I went to Palos Verdes High School in French and are you the Kevin Springer um, you know from Birmingham Michigan I, that I kissed when we were six when we <laughs> left when we <laughs> left my mom in front of the whole neighborhood said, Suzanne, I mean, everybody was there. You've got to come over and kiss Kevin because you two, you know, are inseparable. Oh, you. my goodness. And as I like to say, I sure do remember that kiss because I had didn't get very many in life. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we immediately, uh, it turned out that... Uh, both she and I had come to cry into a personal relationship with Christ through Billy Graham. Wow. At a 1963 very famous crusade. And um, there were probably in the Coliseum the day that I turned to Christ hearing Billy Graham um, preach. There were probably, a, well, it's the largest crowd, 100, I think it was 124,000 people were there. Wow. In the history of the Coliseum. Uh, and um, Suzanne, at that same crusade, came to Christ. So we connected, and it's like we never uh, left off where we were, and, and one thing led to another. We got married uh, that March, and uh, then uh, moved to Maine to teach, but we were connected with Ray Nethery in Ohio. Yep, yep. who well, I know. And Ray, Ray said... Um, why don't you come on staff at this Libri? At that time, it was patterned off a of Libri and be a householder. Hmm. And uh, so we did. And during the seven years there, involved in uh, the same movement that Rich Nathan and Steve Nicholson were involved in. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of complicated. I don't want to bore you with all that. <laughs> no, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Except I did, I did campus outreach at that time. And Ray said, uh, asked me if I would start editing a newsletter, I mean, sorry, a, a magazine called Common Life. And uh, I said, okay, uh, I think of myself as a writer, uh, per se. And um, then from there, uh, after seven years, we moved to Michigan, planted church in Michigan. And uh, while there, I was uh, hired by servant publications, um, which is a predominantly Catholic uh, publishing company, uh, but they wanted a, uh, an evangelical on staff. 
mm. because uh, Pastoral Renewal was a journal for leaders in, that went to uh, priests and evangelical pastors all over the country. Forty-two thousand is pretty good. Is a pretty good uh, circulation. And so, but from when Ray asks you to edit and write to then getting hired with this publishing company, did writing come to you naturally? Was it like, oh yeah, this is well, this I is guess what it, I think. I'm... I guess it must have um, because <laughs> uh, Ray, Ray actually asked me to write a letter to the zoning board about putting in a big lodge and expansion. I think you've been there to, uh -huh. and, to the Great Haven and that lodge there. He said we have to get a zoning change. I want would you write the letter for this? And I said I can't write. That I took a creative writing course at USC, and I remember I had a professor from NYU who, when I, you know, I did this piece of fiction, and and he wrote on it, "This is real crap." <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I told Ray, I said, Ray, I can't write. So there's and, nothing natural about it to you, like, oh yeah, of course. No, no, no. But then, but then I wrote this letter, and Ray came back. He went to the zoning meeting, and. And the key person on the zoning board said, I was a dead set against this until I read this letter. And it was mm. compelling and convincing. And Ray looked at me and said, you can write. I go, okay. So then that led to editing Common Life magazine and interviewing a lot of interesting people. And uh, then I, in Ann Arbor, I made connection with um, the people who are involved with Servant. It was called the Word of God community. It's an ecumenical community. Mm. And... Uh, Bert Gezi, in particular, became a very good friend. Uh, mm. Bert's a, just an outstanding guy. And um, then um, it's, it's a little complicated, but they came and while I was pat while I was planting this church. Uh, they said, we want you uh, to hire you as an editor. And I said, well, I can work half time. And they said, we'll take you half time. Well, my passion became the writing, and I was also involved. We would put leadership conferences on too, and, and we would um, have people like J.I. Packer, who was a part of our, wow. you know, would come in and speak and call all over the country. So I got to meet all kinds of leaders. I I called my years in Michigan in the school of leadership, mm. as well as learning, you know, doing my first church plant in in Ohio. I had done a lot of um, Ray said, I think you'd be good at going out to colleges and developing student groups. And so I went to places like Case Western Reserve, but especially at the College of Worcester. Um, and, um, yeah, I know that's cool. And yeah. other, you know, Ohio is the, is the state of, uh, I guess you call it small, these, all these small colleges, more than yep. just the main place. It's interesting. So um, Starting things, planting, reaching out, that's kind of in my DNA, but uh, also writing. I like to say I'm a pastor who writes, not a writer who pastors. There, mm. There's actually a difference. Yeah. Uh, and John Wimber, when we got connected, really liked that. He, he and liked tell me it. about that. How did you end up? Well, at Servant, it started at Servant, and it started with C. Peter Wagner. Huh. Peter Wagner, of course, at School World Mission, it was one of the most well-known missiologist in, uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, Kevin Parada, who's coming to visit me next week mm. uh, with Louise, and I interviewed uh, C. Peter Wagner. And uh, we listened to him and we decided we, we want to title this, this uh, uh, interview a third way question. Mm. And uh, I like to think that's where that term originally, because Pete said that. That's where right. it came that, that interview in the July, August, 1983 pastoral renewal journal. So, but in that interview, Pete said to us, you, you know, you guys really need to meet this guy, John Wimber. You need to get to know John Wimber. Well, who's that? <laughs> and so uh, Kevin, Kevin said, I don't know. You want to do something with it afterward? And I said, yeah, I do. So I uh, phoned up John Wimber and uh, out of the blue, I just said, you know, uh, I'm a journalist. I'd like to, to interview you and publish it in Common Life, this magazine out in Ohio that, with a circulation of just a few thousand, you know. Right. That. And um, he said, great. So we did the interview and it uh, went really well. And, um, you know, I, I've got to tell you something before that. Well, no, I, that, that's okay. Uh, anyway, it went very well. And then John 
uh, when an interview, I sent it to him and, and he phones me up and he said, uh, you're the first guy who's really gotten it, got, got me. You understand? Mm. And um, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and um, he said, I've got to meet you. Well, what I didn't know was a little backstory in that is he had been, he had many book contracts on, on his desk. Especially from a publisher you known as Hotter and Stoughton in England, and then Harper and Rowe, it's now called Harper Collins here in America. Yep. Publishing, the publishing world has changed quite a bit since then. But, um, and um, the back story is that he and Carol, and Carol told me this again just a month or two ago, I think, I'm Carol, uh, that they've been praying for three years for the person who is to come alongside. With John to write. Wow. Yeah. Because John is such a gifted leader, pastor, catalytic, dynamic leader, and musician. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't, writing wouldn't, wasn't really his thing. And even if it were, he didn't really have time. He, right. he was running at that time what I would describe as a three ring circuit. He had right. right. Ministries International, where he literally was all over the world speaking, and uh, it's pretty crazy. He had, of course, uh, VMG. It wasn't called VMG. Vineyard Music Group. Mm -hmm. Music. And, and then this church that, that was had thousands of people in it. So uh, anyway, he said, will, will you come down to Houston? I'd like to meet you up. So he sent me a ticket. Um, actually, before that, though, uh, I said, John, um, uh, this is over the phone. So I'm in Michigan on the phone with John. and. Mm -hmm. and I said, John, will you pray for me? And I had been prayed for by somebody. I should back up here. I don't come out of a Pentecostal background, charismatic. Mm -hmm. Right. I was very, very open to the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it was through the Catholic charismatic that yep. really opened up for me. And um, but there was a man by the name of Mahesh Tabda who had spoken uh, spoke at. Um, Michigan State University, a little bit before I met John. And I was really kind of worn out, <laughs> mm. to be honest. And Bert Gedney said, go and hear Mahesh, you know. And, and Mahesh was uh, this uh, Indian uh, guy, first time in 800 years, somebody in his family had become Christian. Wow. And, and he had this powerful ministry of the Holy Spirit, I guess you'd say. So he spoke. I went up and talked to him after he spoke. There were only about 300 people there. And I said, hey, you know, Bert, and we're interacting. And, and, but as he's talking, he's kind of, his hand's moving. I can feel a powerful force. Mm. I, he said, hey, what, what can I do for you? I said, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really dry. I'm just burnt out. He said, oh, okay. Um, Holy Spirit, come and fill Kevin. Bam! I was, I was literally blown 10 feet up against the wow. wall. And I wasn't knocked out. Yeah. Quite the, quite the contrary. I was super conscious of the presence mm. and power of God. Well, when, when I asked John to pray for me on the phone before going to Houston, because I, I could sense something's going on here. Um, and God, God was my friend. He spoke to me. Mm. You know, um, God always used big words in my life. And he was speaking to me, you know. So John said, okay. And he said, come Holy Spirit, fill him. And I was literally knocked off my chair. The phone fell to the ground. That was before we had cell phones or anything. Wow. But I could hear him, it was only John could do, laughing on the phone. And then he clicked off. That night, there was like this power that went through my body. And I spoke mm. that weekend down in, um, down in Toledo. And uh, to a men's, I was asked to speak at a men's gathering. And when I moved my hand, this was not intentional. And it wasn't, I wasn't speaking the Holy Spirit or anything. Hmm. I moved my hand and a whole row of guys were knocked off their chairs. And by the way, nothing like that has ever happened since then. Yeah, but there was just some unique moment for you, yeah, right? right? Yeah. The power of God came on. It was amazing. So anyway, I go down to Houston. I meet John and I immediately hit it off. And uh come home, then he phones up and he says, okay, I've got these, these book contracts and uh, we've been praying for three years. And um, 
will, will you come out to Anaheim while you meet Carol? And met him and he said, well, you're the one. So that's how, that's how we got connected. We signed mm. a, a four book contract for England and the United States. They were actually separate contracts. And, uh, and out of that came the book, Power of Evangelism. But I didn't immediately move. It's interesting. When I went back to uh, Michigan, uh, Suzanne said, I really think we need to wait a little while before we move because we need to really move. We need to leave the church well. Yeah. Well, and, and really do it the right way. So, and Suzanne's like that, full of integrity. Right. <laughs> you know? And uh, and I learned long ago to listen to her. Um, it, it is a little anecdote kind of person, Suzanne is. When we went on our honeymoon, you know, we, uh, we went to a place called Arrowhead in uh, in uh, Southern California here in the mountains and it was nine it was a ninety dollar uh, cost for five days in this little cabin we got hmm. uh, I wrote the check the check bounced uh, <laughs> Suzanne was mortified because she's the daughter of a Harvard MBA right <laughs> right yeah so she took over she took over the checkbook that day and I'm not <laughs> we've been married 53 years and and never has a check bounce in 53 years. Wow. So, <laughs> that was the last one. So, yeah. <laughs> so I listened to Suzanne, you know, we're, right. we're a team. And anyway, she said, I had to hang around. Well, in staying there, then um, I was able to interact with my writing mentor, Kevin Parada, who we are very close today. As I said, he's coming in this Sunday for a week with his wife. Mm -hmm. And um, he had written several books. Kevin went to Columbia, smart guy, very, very, one of the smartest guys I've ever known. And uh, so he and a guy named John Blattner, also a servant, um, kind of coached me through as I worked with John. And uh, we worked from notes from MC 510 and mm -hmm. uh, talk notes, but also um, when, I, when we did move back home, and we consider California home. Uh, in uh, December of, of, uh, 1984, um, then John and I would, all the time, I would go to his home and we would interact and uh, then I'd go back to my office and work. And so we did a lot of hanging together, but but processing, processing, processing. Well, cause, so that's what I wanted to ask. So you're taking the notes from MC510 um, well, that's only part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part of it. So you're taking that, then you're taking conversations. With so are you actually writing? Yeah, or is I'm John writing. throwing things at you like, hey, yeah. here's 30 pages. And then pages. he takes it and changes, edit this, that, right. go and do that. And uh, I want to be very clear. This is all John Wimber. Of course. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. My my job is to, is to facilitate and really, I would ask questions. You know, I'd say like, yeah. Well, uh, this might not be clear to the reader. We're always always wanting to come to terms with the reader. And uh, we also were very concerned, uh, he was concerned that, that the writing had, it wasn't just for the vineyard. You've got to remember in 84, I mean, there was no real vineyard denomination or, right. you know, uh, so uh, it was meeting a broad section of people from Roman Catholics, Pentecostals, the Baptists, Presbyterian mainline. And that's one of the reasons he kind of liked me is, is that I had experience, you know, in this broad uh, field of yes. Christians. And um, he thought that would work well with the books, some of the questions that I would mm. read. And I, just as a little aside, we became just very, very good friends. And so yeah. we talked about about everything, our families. And um, like I said, lots of times we'd work and he'd say, let's go out to lunch. He's always wanted to eat. God bless him. <laughs> and I would get really upset. I'd look at a little John Wimber anecdote. I'd sit there and I'd say, John, you really you really want to have that piece of pie. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, you're that close where you're yeah, going. Yeah, and, and, and I only eat that. I've always right. needed to be a little on the more skinny side, so he would mock me in some way. But we, he, we, we were <laughs> great. Man. What a gift, yeah. 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 He, he, um, 
So in, in October 1st, 1985, the uh, English edition with Hodder's of Power Evangelism was published in May 1st of 86, the Harper edition here in the United States came out. Mm -hmm. And it was later in the United States because the um, editorial protocols in the United States at that time were much more, more strict and then in um in england in great mm. britain and uh however that book has stood the test of time and i should tell it'd be interesting for the listeners to know john wimber said in you know november 17th will be the 25th anniversary of his death mm. 25 years and he told me uh he said kevin um when i am long gone the one thing that will remain will be the books wow yeah, and so Power Evangelism is still uh, in publication, and we've also put together a, a study guide. Which yeah. I, I really put the study guides together uh, because um, small groups, when I was on staff even in Anaheim, I oversaw the small group system and had a very strong feeling about discipleship mm. and all that, which John agreed with. It's It's hard to imagine the pressures that, and the demands that were on John Wimber during this period. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot going on. But um, a few years ago, Christianity Today uh, named uh, Power Evangelism the 12th most significant book written in evangelicalism in the last 50 years of last century. Wow. Most impactful. And what's funny about that is, at that time, actually, it's a little longer ago, uh, a guy named by the name of Hal Lindsey was was attending my church. He was my, I was actually in a Bible study with Hal, Hal Lindsey in wow. high school, and so I don't know Hal. Hal's still alive, but um, when his book was named like number fifteen, Power Benches, <laughs> <laughs> we had a big laugh about it. Uh, I bet. But, listen, uh, that book, um, like it or not, sold. Tens of millions of copies. It did. It a great certainly did. So anyway, then we jumped into, of course, um, power healing. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, uh, for me personally, power healing is my most favorite. That's my favorite book hmm. that we wrote. Uh, and power healing is very much is still a Harper edition, and it's still published today. And uh, we put together a study guide for that. That was published in 1987. Mm-hmm. Then in 1988, Power Encounters, uh, this is uh, really a book of testimonies uh, mm. by leaders from uh, uh, people like David Watson and others mm -hmm. from all over the world. Um, and uh, that book did very well in both uh, England and the United States. And then we, uh, in 1991, the book PowerPoints mm -hmm. was published. And uh, also with PowerPoints, a study guide published by um, Regal Books was the way to maturity that was meant to be in tandem with that to work with small groups and discipleship. Mm -hmm. Power evangelism and power healing did very well. PowerPoints did not. Hmm. Uh, and it's out of print and uh, for whatever reason, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. And then there were a lot of other... Uh, projects along the way, and the the other thing that John asked me to do when when I when I came west was to become the editor of Equipping the Saints magazine. Yeah, and magazines were in my wheelhouse, and uh, Equipping the Saints at that time went to about a hundred thousand people, uh, not just in in North America, but down under, and and uh, of course Great Britain and all. And so it, mm. it was um, it was that was a great. That was a lot of, that was good. <laughs> yeah, pretty, wow. I mean, that's a lot of writing. Yeah, so, and Suzanne became the editor of the Vineyard Newsletter, which was the first newsletter for Vineyard Churches. Hmm. And Suzanne's a good writer in her own right. Um, and uh, she, uh, she would interview uh, different pastors around the country in the Vineyard Newsletter, and uh, would talk to about their story and what's going on in the church and in their lives. And she did a wonderful job with that. And uh, that also, John Limber had us doing that. And um, 
Well, there, that's a little bit of the history. And then at, when John Wimber, the, you asked, this is about my story. When John Wimber <laughs> uh, died or got very sick and he had to retire, and a new pastor was, was named at, at the Anaheim Vineyard. In fact, it's interesting, the new pastor, Carl Tuttle, asked, he came to me and said, will you, become, will you be the executive pastor? And I said, well, the problem is with this, Carl, I don't have an administrative bone in my body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you're, the exact you're, wrong job. You're really right. asking the wrong guy to right. do this. Uh, I would be miserable and probably people that I'm supposed to be responsible for would be miserable. But I think it takes a special gifting and a right. uh, special kind of person to do that sort of job. And that's not me. So, but what I like to do is plant and start things, you know, whether it's publications or whatever it is, that's just in my nature. So, um, we were um, at the York Minster Cathedral in York, England on our 25th anniversary. Uh, We've been invited over to uh, Great Britain to do some marriage conferences and mm. York is our favorite city. In, it's in, beautiful. Yeah, it is. And uh, the Lord spoke to us about going to Palm Desert to plant a church, and John endorsed that completely. And then John and, uh, supported us financially for a while in the starting of what's called what became the Desert Springs Vineyard, but it's called the Desert Springs Church today. And that's a little bit about how what went on from there. And so, um, so all throughout, you're still pastoring. You're not just writing. Well, you're, for about eight years, when I was with John, I was I was writing. Just writing, like you're no, head not down. just writing. I I helped write uh, messages for him. Oh, I did okay. messages. I worked with him. A guy named Ken Fish, who ministers in Vineyard today. He, yeah, Ken is brilliant, and he actually, as a young man, worked helped John in in writing a lot mm. of uh, some messages back then. Very very bright guy, very gifted guy. Yeah, and um, uh, I I. When I was um, that year and a half that I was uh, an associate pastor at Anaheim, I developed a Saturday night service. I led that. I did a whole bunch of outreach. We did things like the Blue Moon Cafe and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun because yeah, mm. evangelism is very much in my heart. And uh, I oversaw a small group system, which is about, um, I think we had like 120 small groups at that time. Uh, but Pastoring that's like herding cats. Uh, yeah, I'd say. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, you know, that's another topic. Uh, but John was sick. And um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a pastor who writes. And uh, so yeah. uh, and so now in retirement, I mean, uh, Suzanne and I have strong connections to France. And we had a word uh, given to us when we were in college. We were involved in something called the J.C. Light Powerhouse hmm. in Southern California. And um, this goes back to the whole Jesus People movement and everything. But God spoke to us that, that we would have, when we were older, we would have a connection with France. Suzanne hmm. uh, went to the University of Strasbourg in France. She attended there for a year and lived there for a year and a half. So that's in Alsace. And um, I've been invited over and spoken, and uh, I'm right now I'm coaching uh, two pastors and the national uh, young life, the director of young life for for all of France. Uh, wow. These cool. three three pastoral leaders I coach, and then there are other pastors I coach, and not and I obviously don't just coach vineyard guys, you know. Uh, yeah. I just get encouraged. You know, I'm an older brother, and actually some of the guys I've been with so long, we're just brothers, you know. Yeah, exactly. Older, younger. So, so that's a little bit of that history. And, well, so uh, let, me, let me ask you a bit of a question around that. Because away. you have such a unique gift and call on your life in that, A, you were able to spot and notice leaders, and the Lord led you to, and – Kevin, it seems as though, and I, I'm I'm reading in a little bit, but it seems as though you were willing to sort of stand to the side and really assist and help John Wimber and or the church while you're still doing incredibly prolific ministry. I mean, talking about leading small groups and then planting a church. Yeah, that was that was my job. Now, Suzanne and I would lead couples groups. We would disciple couples together. Lead, we would spot, pray it through. 
spot leadership couples, and we would bring like a half dozen of them together for a year in our home while I was editing. Because discipleship, uh, you know, and especially raising up leadership has always been in my heart. Mm. Uh, but my job there in Anaheim, God, I had a big word. And, and that big word, I was called to, you know, really serve and submit to John. And I have to tell you, in 10 years, we only had two run-ins, John and me. Hmm. Uh, disagreements, and uh, which we worked through. It was an it was an amazing relationship. But my job was, in fact, as you said, to serve him and be loyal to him. Every month, we introduce a new book or recommended resource to dig in deeper. For June, we've recommended that everyone reads Power Healing by John Wimber and Kevin Springer. If you've been enjoying today's conversation between Kevin and Jay, you won't want to miss it. Power Healing is available through book retailers everywhere. This summer and fall, the Vineyard USA community is gathering all over the country. Make sure to check out our events page at vineyardusa.org to learn more about these gatherings that we have for our nine regions, our four associations, and through our entities like Vineyard Worship and Vineyard Youth. You can register for an upcoming event online. We're asking God to cultivate an expectancy and a hunger for our times together. Hope to see you there. So talk to me a little bit more about, you know, because Everybody wants a clear sense of like what God, the big thing God's called them to. And in sort of the Barnabas way, right? Like Barnabas seems in the Bible to have this ability to come alongside and to serve. He kind of switches roles with Paul, for example. He's a guy advocating for John Mark along the way. Right. It's when I'm listening to you, you have this unique gifting, calling, favor to take a prolific leader's abilities and then, you know, hone, sharpen, thicken, develop, bring those things to the ground. What would you want to say to someone who maybe oh, is like you? Like they're going, uh, I think yeah. maybe I'm called to do that or. Yeah, I think, I think that um, the Lord has given Suzanne and me just a real happiness in seeing the success of others. Mm-hmm. And, um, and to try to contribute to that in any way. Now, look, you know, I'm human. I, there are certain accomplishments <laughs> that I want to have too. Sure. Uh, but it's within my my gift mix, and he's called me. Uh, I have to have a gift mix of uh, what we call entrepreneurial. Uh, some might call it small a apostolic starting things. Yeah. Um, evangelism um leadership and so um you know there's there's a focus there and um but my my i'm settled in coming alongside and encouraging good yeah i guess you'd say barnabas gift of encouragement i try to yeah. be to people even even la- even leaders who have fallen we we talked about a couple before we started here but yeah uh, I've intentionally tried to come alongside and encourage them uh, because God's all out for them. He's all out for all of us. Yeah. And um, I think one of the things, I, I have a very, very close friend. He's a businessman. And um, he once told me, he said, you know, one of the, he said in business, these guys, they get a bad deal going and they write somebody off and they'll never talk to him again, never do a business deal with him again. They're dead to him. He said, if I'd done that, some of the best deals that eventually came to me would have never come to me. Hmm. And I think in the Christian life, um, we need to have bigger hearts. We need to take uh, Jesus' prayer in John 17, you know, more seriously. Even, you know, may they be one as we are one. And not organizationally one, it's it's one in the Holy Spirit. You know, it, it's not one in power structures or all the rest of that. It's it's one in, in terms of um, encouraging one another, seeing the best in one another. And so God's just kind of put that on my heart. And, uh, and I'm at peace with that. And um, 
I don't know what else you want me to say. Well, and I mean, uh, but John, I did, by the way, I, in, I was called to serve, submit, protect, and remain loyal to him. Hmm. And uh, there were always people wanting something from John. Always. That's the nature of anybody in that position. Uh, Jay, you're in that position now. Mm-hmm. And people are going to want things from you. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. know that in the podcast, but that's just the reality. <laughs> it is true. Yes, it yes, is true. <laughs> it, it is very, very true. And um, it's interesting how a lot of times these people who meet with John at his house, well, I would be there. So I was like a fly on the wall, you know, mm-hmm. with some of stuff. and then they leave and then he look at me and say, let's talk. <laughs> and uh, by the way, one time I looked at him and he said, I said, are you asking for my opinion about this person or this or that? He said, yes. And, and I used the, I said, well, you have to. He said, whoa, 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 stop. I said, well, he said, there's three words that, you, that I never want to hear from you. I said, mm-hmm. what are those words? You have to mm-hmm. <laughs> from me. And I realized, oh, yeah, that's not my job. My job is to listen, be an encouragement, maybe have a different way of viewing things. Uh, but, um, you know, John was his own man. And I want to talk another thing about John. John was, John was a jazz musician. People need to understand that about John. Um, in fact, the Vineyard Movement, I've always looked at that and I thought, this is interesting. The early days of the Vineyard Movement were led by, it was led by musicians. Yeah. I mean, where do you find that in Western <laughs> <laughs> And so John was, because he was an artist, remember these histories with the famous Righteous Brothers and so on, and Bill Medley and Bobby Hatfield. By the way, Carl Hatfield's brother was Bobby's brother. He was in my church huh. in uh, Palm Desert. Uh, wonderful, wonderful man who died from Alzheimer's, and Bobby came to his funeral and just wept, you know, mm. and, but John, it meant he was a creative leader. He was an intuitive leader. He had very quick reads on people, and he was almost always right. And he kind of, he kind of treated ministry like a, like a composer, in which um, he always saw the whole as bigger than the individual parts. Mm. And um, it was quite, quite unique. The other thing is a jazz musician, John Wimber, accepted everybody. It didn't matter what the color of your skin was, what your gender was, what your what your national. He was not a nationalist. He was he was truly a global Christian in that mm-hmm. regard. And so, people from all over the world gravitated to him, and all over the map denominationally. I mean, mm-hmm. one of my best friends today is a guy named Dave Nodar. Dave Nodar is out of Baltimore, Maryland. He leads Christ Life Ministry, and it's a, it's a ministry, he's a Roman Catholic, and it's a ministry to Catholic, to bring Catholics into a personal relationship with Christ mm. and disciple them. But he owes everything to John, remember? Mm. You know, uh, he loves John, he loves Carol. And um, that's the kind of person he was. And so just being around that and watching him operate, I never rose to that level as a leader, but it was just great. But then he'd like to process them. So, well, that's, yeah, that's, so give me what you think are some of the implications of sort of the jazz musician style of leading and you sort of coming alongside of that. Well, I, okay, one of the implications is when, when the vineyard, um, and I can remember this conversation with Peter Wagner, uh, the decision for the vineyard to become a denomination, which is not really, it's sort of like the Christian church is, Yep. It's not a denomination. You know, in other words, we're going to have recognized structure, vineyard name, uh, all the rest of it. Um, Pete Wagner looked at John and said, um, and it was just Pete and, Pete and John and I. By the way, Pete Wagner called me with all the time. Because the book, the books are John Wimber with Kevin Smith. <laughs> <laughs> so you he, are with Peter, Peter Wagner was that's one of the funny, funniest, actually. Peter Wagner was one of the funniest human beings ever. That made. is such a good line with. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. found him shut up. <laughs> he just laughed. But um, he told John in this conversation, because people were coming at John in the early days. We want to be a big, want to be a big. And um how can you got to start an association? You got to start young. You got to. And uh, Pete said, when that happens, 
structurally, organizationally, you will not be able to operate the way you operate when there are about 200 churches that are involved. Mm. There, there will have to be a transition to a different kind of leadership. Mm. You have to deal with administrative and bureaucratic issues and so on. And, um, and so um, it was a monumental decision for John when he said, okay, let's go that direction. And I have to tell you something. When that happened, and there were officially recognized vineyard churches, the interdenominational appeal of John's ministry began to end. Interesting. A lot of, uh, I did a survey. I would also get curious about things. So, I would, and John always would give me free hand with his stuff. I'd say, you know, John, um, we're going to have, uh, I think, 5,000 leaders coming from all over the world. Mm-hmm. To you know, in Anaheim. Who are these people? <laughs> you know, where uh, where are they coming to... from? Yeah, why, and, why are they here? I remember, because I cut my teeth at the Center for Pastoral Renewal, and we were committed in you know, we, we knew and were able to measure who they were. Well, they were from, from uh, every denomination. And, um, but mostly... Uh, well, mainline, but more evangelical, conservative, very small percentage of Pentecost. Mm. Hardly any. Mm. It's interesting. After, after the vineyard recognized, you know, began to say, okay, now we're a church uh, association, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, um, and we are going to bring churches in, recognize the vineyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, that just fell off. And uh, a lot of these other denominational affiliated groups didn't come. And I think part of it was they were thinking, well, they're going to try to recruit, you know, right. and, and so I think in that, and that was at the same time when, when his influence, how can I call it, the, um, the revival or whatever you want to call it that came out of John began to win because there's only so much shelf life to these things. Right. And that was all part of it. I'm not saying it was right or wrong. It just yeah. is, is. No, it changed it. It changed yeah. his the way he related to other leaders. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So um and then um and then quite frankly his health started to go downhill and and he he also should be aware he built this at that time, $25 million, which today would probably be $75 million building. Mm-hmm. In fact, no, I think today the building, I talked to the uh, commercial appraiser, Steve Blackmire, about it. He said it, it's worth between 100 and 120 million. Wow. But back in the day, it was 20, that was real money back yeah. in 89, 90, And um, that, that took its toll, just a whole bunch of things. Yeah, yeah. it's a and, lot of pressure. Yeah. yeah, then he got sick, and he wasn't sick that long. He retired um, in uh, nine, uh, two, I'm sorry, in 95, mm-hmm. and he died in 97, yeah. November 17th, 1997. But he was sick. I went up and spent time with John at Arrowhead. He had an Arrowhead home uh, just a few weeks before he passed away. We sat out on his porch. He was, he was quite ill. And kind of talked and, and reminisced a little bit about it and about the vineyard and his background and so on. I think I, I learned something from that. I think all leaders, certainly I'm 74 years old and I, and I do this. I look back and I go, why did I do that that way? Why didn't I do it? Mm-hmm. And what I said to John is, John, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. You walk with the Lord and you walk with them and you just, just, you know, you are where you are now. I, I yeah. You have to. I said, <laughs> stop, it. <laughs> stop it. He laughed. He laughed. And um, but now I found myself trying to remember that too, as I look back. So I, um, yeah. So tell tell me a little bit about that. Like when you talk to, or you're aware of younger leaders, what are some of the key pieces of advice you have? Like a a young pastor starting out young leaders, you're mentoring all kinds of leaders, you're yeah. aware of how things have changed. What are the key pieces you're like, hey, I want to remind you of this, or here's something yeah. I've learned along the way. Yeah, well, obviously, it is. 
Ray Netherig said to me when I went out to plant the first church, he said, Kevin, your first church plant in Michigan, God's going to be more interested in what he does to you than what he does through you. Yeah. And uh, that proved to be very true. Mm. And uh, what I tried, when I got in trouble, uh, is when my identity got caught up in being a pastor, being a writer, whatever it might be. Mm. Uh, because um, uh, our identity is in Christ, our union with Christ. And that there needs to be, I, I try to encourage young leaders, you need to have a certain, keep a certain kind of a distance uh, from what, it isn't that you don't care for the people that you're pastoring, the, and that you're discipling, or whatever you're doing. It's that um, you not allow that to become an idolatry. Mm. And what I see in a lot of younger pastors is a certain kind of pressure, and it becomes a, a subtle idolatry. The church becomes an idol. And um, that got me in trouble for yeah. a while. And I actually had to go to some counseling, and I worked it through. And um, there, there are some classic literature I read that really helped a lot. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and then, so my last few years, uh, in my church as a pastor were, were very fruitful. It, it wasn't that there weren't problems. There were going to always be problems. As John Wimber used to always say, an empty barn is a clean barn. Well, <laughs> you know, you can go to Psalms and there are a lot of Psalms. For yep. That. So, um, yeah, uh, I try to, try to encourage, um, young leaders and say the only way you're going to be able to maintain that healthy distance from being caught up with the church is by being caught up with Christ. Hmm. And that comes from intimacy with him and cultivating hearing his voice and then obeying when he speaks. And hmm. if you do that, you're going to be better off. It's not going to be easy. In fact, that'll get you in trouble because when God, when God speaks and God is and I believe God works this way. In my life, he's spoken through big words, I call them. That big words come at crossroads of life. Mm. And um, the problem with big words is you hear God's voice and, and you, you move on it, like, like going to Palm Desert. Uh, the big word, you're going to go in Israel and take the land. It didn't get easier. Yeah. <laughs> they crossed the Jordan. It became infinitely more complex. Yeah. And I, and I think talking to young leaders about this, you know, understand it goes to the territory, and it's only through intimacy with Christ. Amen. It's something that John understood. Carol Wimber really talks a lot about this. Hmm. Uh, she, 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 is, she is really precious and uh, so encouraging, and, and she meant so much to Suzanne. Hmm. Um, the other thing I talked to the leaders, can I get a little practical here? Um I'm going to put in a I, word. I like practical. Practical's good. <laughs> uh, you also have to be smart, you know. Uh, and um, I say to these, some of these young leaders, I say, you know, and I say to churches, um, think in terms you have to, you have your family, you have your future. And um, what, what has disturbed me recently working with some pastors is some pastors are getting older, they start having health problems and so on, and they're, they're virtually penniless. Hmm. And, and so I say, you've got to also be smart when you're younger. Yeah. You know, so be careful and uh, uh, think in terms of uh, this, that, now, the future, because leaders don't live in the now. Hmm. Effective leaders anticipate, are always thinking in terms of the future yeah. and, and anticipating, you know, uh, let me give an, a practical example of that. Well, coming back to the, to the financial thing, whether it be having, uh, I strongly believe churches have a responsibility to set up a reasonable retirement program yes. for their senior pastors. It ought to be a requirement in every church, for example, or some tent makers, you know, whatever. Um Okay, the other point is I think I just lost. So <laughs> no, but well, you just be smart, prepare yes. ahead of time as a young yeah. leader. Yeah, Make financial uh, plans. Yeah, yeah. Um, let Let me give an example. COVID. Let's talk about COVID. We 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 know the effect of this. I don't know about 
what you're seeing, but a lot of guys, 30% decline in attendance. Some churches are on fumes right now. Um, by the way, I don't think that's that's something my friend Dave Nodar says. It's a good thing, Kevin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, this is this is all part of God's plan. You know, to, to really uh, uh, get the church that He really wants. We can mm-hmm. say that. Okay? And uh, so I say, well, you know, with COVID, first time, shame on them. Second time, shame on you. Mm-hmm. What happens when something like this hits again? Yeah. Will you be ready? Are you going to be, you know, do, and I don't tell them what the response needs to be. That's what the leader's job is. Right. But a leader thinks in terms of the future and especially thinks in terms of the kind of things that so often can go wrong. Yes. I, I uh, joke, uh, we did something in the church I pastored that was really crazy. I knew we had to take the church through the two, three hundred attendance mark. We were only a couple years old, and we started just with a half dozen couples. But um, So we did this phone, uh, this sounds nutty, it's called Phones for You, it's a phones campaign. You can't do it today, because everything's changed. Yep. Um, it was but insane. you just went for it. We're going to invite we, everybody. We went for it. It was yeah. a, we made 30, 40,000 phone calls. Wow. We got a phone room. Uh, I didn't realize it was going to change the people in the church as much as the outreach. Well, when the big grand opening for that whole event came, we were prepared. And I'll never forget uh, the young uh, assistant pastor at that time, our first assistant pastor, his name was Brad Swope. There was a massive traffic jam out to get in. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, for the first time in my life, <laughs> I've been involved with something that was planned like this that actually happened that as it was planned. Yeah, <laughs> and, and all I got to say about that is, rarely does it work that way. So as a leader, are you prepared, you know, to know the things that can go wrong? And so yeah. on? When they go yeah. wrong, understand that God is sovereignly in control. Amen. And he makes no mistakes. Let me give you another illustration of that. In year seven of our church, I said, we need, we need to have a building, own a building. And... Um, as a pastor, and it isn't that every church needs to own a building, not right. less. We need to here own a building, and mm-hmm. it has to do with the demographics of Rancho Mirage and Palm Desert and Indian Wells and all that where I live. So um, we did our due diligence. We lined up the financing. We did the capital campaign, and. Um, and uh, as is typical in these sort of things, there's a group of people that rise up that aren't happy. That's, but that goes with the territory. Right. You can anticipate that. Uh, and then um, the week we're to close on the building, we were buying a temple, a Jewish temple. Hmm. We get a phone call from one of the largest Christian lending institutions saying, uh, you know, the, the representative, he felt terrible. He says, the board left, met, and we just think you're a bad risk. Oh. So there's no money. It's not Last coming. minute, yeah. It, that was supposed to close Friday. Wow. So I took, on Monday, I took my uh, youth pastor out, and I said, you know, uh, James, his name is James. I said, James, I think you need to think in terms of where you're going to be, <laughs> because uh, we have a group of people who said, this is not the will of God, this is not the will of God. But I had a big word. This is one of my big words. I don't have very many big words. This was the will of God, right? But obviously, my crisis wasn't that we weren't going to get the building. My crisis was God's my friend, and I hear his voice. Mm. I don't understand God. You said this. Yeah. While I am sitting there with James, I receive a phone call. He says, um, um, is this Kevin Springer? Yeah, well, this is, it wasn't his name. I said, this is Avi Hershkowitz. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the agent representing the temple. Mm. And I understand that your financing fell through to buy our temple. And, but we're buying a church. There's a domino thing going on. So, um, Kevin, uh, I've lined up financing for you. Now, this is, this is unbelievable. While I'm sitting there staring at my youth pastor, and I'm thinking, is this a joke? Yeah. 
He said, go down to this foundation, the Berger Foundation, and talk to Ron Allen. It's a secular foundation. He'll give you the money. At that time, it was over. It wasn't a lot. It was over a million dollars. But for me, it might have been a hundred million dollars. Yeah, exactly. It's more than you know what to do with, right? So I go, okay. I hang up. And I look at James. I said, well, I was getting ready to get in an airplane, go back to Minnesota, to interview for a job. I got to earn. I got to earn a living because I'm out. You know, yeah. I'm not quitting. You know, right? So uh, I go to the foundation. I'm thinking this is this is not true. I go into Ron Allen, and, and we have, mind you, we had three inches of background. We were fully audited, our church. It was, we were as clean as a hound's too. Yeah. And, and I said, well, here's our due diligence. He goes, well, I don't need that. I said, what do you mean? He says, we're not a bank. I'm a foundation. How much do you need? I go, well, this X amount. He says, just go get a, a secretary statement from the board that you agree to the loan. And tell me that you're not gonna you're not gonna go anywhere for five years. Okay. Next day I bring that in, he hands me the check, we close it a day early. A Jewish realtor wow. and and a and a secular foundation filled in the gap for the Christians that failed. Yeah. Now exactly. am I mad at the Christians? No. Am I excited about God? Yes. Yeah, what a and gift. this is what I say to young pastors. Just understand that that you trust him and God works in ways that you never imagine and rarely does it go according to your plans. Amen. That way you can never claim some kind of credit for what yes. happened. Yes. And that's what I said to the church. I got up in front and I said when when we when we uh opened the church in December. I said, um, all credit goes to God. No oh, man. And the Jewish real estate agent. Yeah, and, and the guy who stepped in. <laughs> but I think That's we so need good. Storms, right? Don't we? Do we, you we, don't, we need those. Well, they keep you they keep you dependent in a way that if you could just do it all on your own, you wouldn't be. Yeah, I agree. That's... But that will only happen if you have an intimate relationship with God. And the only thing that upset me was, God, you're my friend. Yeah. I thought you me. asked me to do this, right? This is a big word. And yeah. I didn't have, I have a lot of big words. In fact, I can almost, my life is broken up into chunks based on a big word. Mm. I got a big word at York Minster. You're to go to, you know, from Isaiah, was, there'll be streams in the desert. Oh, mm. okay. And then Wimber said, yes, that's right. I got, I'd always get confirmation. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Let, let me ask you one last question and okay. I'll let you go. Okay. You've been in the vineyard before there was a vineyard That's necessarily. Right. You've That's been right. through the whole movement. Mm -hmm. You still are connected to any number of folks. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, tell love, me, love the vineyard. so tell me what your prayers are for the vineyard right now. What do you, what do you think you're praying for? What would you be asking? telling us we should be asking God for keeping an eye on? What, what do you think the Lord would want to say, or what is it you're praying for? Well, first thing is, I want to be clear, I haven't said this, uh, I, don't, I don't believe in the good old days. I believe mm -hmm. there's a good old and bad old days. Yeah. And so <laughs> there's both. If, right. you, if what you hear in this, in this interview or this podcast, and if you're listening, is, well, if only we could have all that again. No, 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 no. A full mm. barn is, is, is a messy barn. Mm. And there were a lot of messes. And um, the first thing I, I pray for is that for people like you, Jay, and the other, other leaders to be listening to God's voice. Amen. Hearing his voice and moving out in obedience to him. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I really have the feeling, based on my conversations with Caleb, that that's that's happening. Amen. I mean, the second thing is, um, if you're going to be a family, act like a family. You know, um, I pray that that you not fall into institutionalization, uh, mm -hmm. clericism, and they call it the Catholic Church. They, they, and they have tremendous problems with that, but all the denominations do. Uh, that that there be that robust uh, relationship. Uh, base uh, with God and with each other 
and you hear his voice in that way. The, the third thing, um, well, you know, he'll speak to you and he'll tell you, my job is, uh, I think that the Levites were told, uh, you work till you're 50 and then you retire, but they didn't retire. They guarded the doors, mm. they held the arms up, the ones that were working. My job is now to say, okay, I'm praying for you that God will, will show you and lead you and hold the arms up and that's what I do with the leaders. But it's now, it's now your turn, if I can say it that way. Mm. So go for it, but go for it with tremendous courage and um, faith, and um, don't be afraid to step out. Remember the the sea didn't part till till they took one step into it. That's mm. when the part part. And uh, there will be discouraging times, but you have to get up, learn from it, and keep going. Ray Nethery used to always say to me, it's about keeping on, keeping on. Mm. And he's 92 years old right now. And you know that when I talked to him two days ago, he was on the highway, 71. His daughter was driving him to Columbus to meet with a leader to encourage him. Wow. And that's a good way to go. Amen. Jay, uh, I look forward to just uh, tremendous, tremendous things coming out of the vineyard. And... Uh, yeah, it's good. Thank you so much. The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org. And we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at, at Vineyard USA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.